Let's bring in Peter King, uh, themmqb.com, si.com, Football Night in America. Peter, when you look at the the different combine drills that take place over these uh, these six days, what's the most relevant one to you? Well, the most relevant things that happen at the combine are the uh, are the medical exams and then the interviews at night. I mean, uh, but of all the you know of all the uh, the drills, I think for a guy like Clowney and for for really a lot of players uh, at, at almost every position, this three cone drill where, as you say, Chris, you've got to show speed and you've got to show agility and got to show change of direction. That's what a football player does, and uh, I, I would I I'd, I'd agree with you on the forty, and I'll take it a step further. You know, the, the, the number about Jadavian Clowney is that that I'm interested in is not four point four seven; it's three point five, which is in a full college football season. Jadavian Clowney sacked the quarterback three and a half times. Now. You can make any statement that you want, any statement about he's quadruple teamed all the time, which, you know, I keep hearing that stuff, and it's such garbage. Lawrence Taylor wasn't triple and double teamed on every snap. When he played Washington, you know, Joe Jacoby would block Lawrence Taylor. That would be his assignment. Sometimes he'd get help, but not all the time. And, you know, Taylor still produced. I, 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 uh, I'd be mo- much more concerned with, with his production than I would be his 40 time. Is the 40-yard dash a relevant drill for a quarterback? No. It's ridiculous. It's dumb. I, I don't, you know, the, the 10 and 20-yard times are a lot more important because you're right. It's you know very, very rare that they run 40 yards straight. That that seems to make sense, Peter. Why wouldn't they – I mean, why would they just change because, the, the drill? Because they – well, they, they do time people on their – on their tens and their twenties, so they, you know, they take, uh, you know, they take those times as well. But I think the point is that the NFL and the scouting the people at the scouting combine feel that we have been measuring this since combine began, and that's basically how players have been measured for years and years and years. So clearly, uh, you know, if you want to judge. Uh, you know, say Marquise Denard's, uh, you know, 40 time versus Deion Sanders or something like that, you know, then you ask yourself, this is a real measure of, it, you know, one cornerback versus one of the great cornerbacks of all time. So I think that's, they, they keep it so that they can measure themselves against the greats who, who played before them. He's Peter King, the MMQB.com. His column, on, his column MMQB is up right now uh, on SI.com. Peter, who did any player help or hurt his stock significantly at the Combine? I mean, I, I, can I just preface this, Chris, by saying that two years ago, the guy who won the scouting Combine is Stephen Hill, the receiver from Georgia Tech. Mm-hmm. He's in the process of having the bustest career of any receiver in that draft. It's a great word, so, Peter. I'm never... I'm never very big on, you know, the receiver from Oregon State who has a great 40 time or something like that. I mean, it's just, I just don't think at the end of the day that it should matter all that much, but it seems to people in the media that it really does matter. And again, I'm not trying to be negative for the sake of being negative. I'm just trying to say that I think that people in our business place far too much stock in it. You spent some time with Johnny Manziel uh, this past weekend. It headlines your column today on SI.com. Has Johnny Manziel's attempt to portray a cleaned-up image had an impact with NFL executives? I think it has. I think people uh, really liked what they saw out of Johnny Manziel this weekend. That was my sense. Um, I had three or four conversations with people who spent time with him, and I think they feel like, I mean, like, for instance, in Jacksonville, they had a, you know, they had a session with him, and he walked in, and this is how I lead my column today on the MMQB, that uh, he basically walked in, and he knew the five decision makers by name, even though he had never met them. He knew them all. He walked right up to him and said, Mr. Khan, pleasure, pleasure to meet you. 
Uh, and so I think things like that have a um, have an impact on uh, on the decision makers because what they're thinking is this guy somehow took the effort to find out who uh, Dave Caldwell was and what he looked like. So when he walked in the room, he could say to him, "Hey, Mr. Caldwell, I'm Johnny Manziel." How significant will Johnny Manziel's pro day be next month? Quite, because uh, I think everybody wants to see him do. Everybody knows that Johnny Manziel can do everything uh, in a game outside the pocket. George Whitfield, his quarterback coach this weekend, said that our job now is to make sure that uh, he does a great job inside the pocket because that's what he's going to be asked to do in the NFL. He's Peter King, the MMQB.com, SI.com, Football Night in America here on the Dan Patrick Show. How serious were the talks between Cleveland and San Francisco about Jim Harbaugh? I don't think they were very serious. I think that they were, I think the Browns uh, thought that uh, they wanted to trade for him. I quote Jed York, the CEO of the 49ers today, saying that uh, we got a call from the the Browns. Uh, We decided not to pursue it. And you can parse that in a lot of ways. Uh, You can say, well, they took a call. What did they say in the course of the phone conversation? Were they interested? Were they not? And I can't tell you for sure whether Jed York got off the phone and went into the organization and said, guys, what do you think we should do? I don't think he did that, but I can't say factually what exactly he did do. I know that the Browns certainly wanted to do it but I don't think the 49ers were ever serious about doing it. Why would San Francisco on any level be willing to part with Jim Harbaugh? Uh, They would be willing to part with him if they felt that they would get a ridiculous offer for him. I mean, what if somebody offers you two ones for a coach you're not sure how long he's going to be there? You're not sure about his shelf life. Jim Harbaugh is is, is a great football coach. And a lot of times, great football coaches like Harbaugh can be hard to work with. And so, look at him. He's never been anywhere longer than four years. Is there a reason for that? I think there probably is. Uh, He gets wanderlust. A lot of great coaches do. Bill Parcells got it all the time. So, uh, I'm not sure right now that that really they uh, have a lot. Uh, They don't want to see Jim Harbaugh go at all, but they really felt like in this particular case, uh, in my opinion anyway, that uh, at least in Cleveland, Cleveland wanted Jim Harbaugh, I think, a lot more than San Francisco wanted to let him go. Do you view Jim Harbaugh as underpaid for a coach of his stature? Well, I suppose so, but I mean, he's in the third year, he just finished the third year of a five year contract. So, so the question becomes when you say he's underpaid, the question is, should a coach like a player have to, have to honor a contract that he has outperformed? Um, and we could argue about that for a long time, but the question is how much the 49ers talk to him about redoing his contract. I believe that Harbaugh wants to be the highest paid coach in football. Well, you could argue maybe he does deserve it. I don't think the 49ers will ever make him the highest paid coach in football until he wins a Super Bowl for a simple reason. If they make him the highest paid coach and then he goes out and wins a Super Bowl, what's he worth then? <laughs> you know, yeah. so uh, I think that I think there's certainly a difference uh, in their uh, idea about what his value is. Talking to Peter King, the MMQB.com, SI.com, Football Night in America. I'll get you out of here with this, Peter. Jason Collins made his debut with the Nets last night, becoming that first openly gay player to participate in one of the four major U.S. sports. How closely, if at all, will NFL executives be paying attention to how his time with Brooklyn plays out? Uh, probably some, but I, I don't know. I, I, um, I, think, I think it's – I think that – when you're talking about how many guys are on an NBA team, 12, 15. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, there, there's, you know, maybe a quarter of the number of guys on the team. Uh, and I'm not saying that that makes all the difference in the world, but I do think that when you look at what happens today in an NFL locker room, 
the number of incredibly disparate personalities in that locker room is is just huge. And it isn't just uh, it isn't just white versus black. It's rural white versus urban black, and and all that. And I'm not saying versus, but it's rural white and or and there's all kinds of different people. There's staunchly religious people. There's staunchly right wing people. There's staunchly liberal people. So, you know, it's it's a, it's an interesting melting pot in every NFL locker room. And I think that's what teams teams that will seriously consider taking Michael Sam, and there definitely are going to be a lot of them. Uh, teams that seriously consider him, I think, are going to try to judge how uh, he'll fit in their own locker room. And I, I'm certain that there will be one uh, that will welcome him in. Good to talk to you, Peter. Safe travels. Take care, Chris.